and welcome to The Arts of the Answer, a co-production of the Arts Council for Monterey County and Access Monterey Peninsula. I'm Steve Elzey, Executive Producer for AMP. And I'm Paulette Lynch, Executive Director of the Arts Council for Monterey County. In the next 30 minutes, artists, educators, and presenters will all be sharing their wonderful stories and their passion for the arts. And how the arts bring vitality and joy into our lives. It all starts right now. I'm here today with Lisa Ghetto. She is a wonderful website designer and trainer and mentor for so many of us in the community. Um, but we're here today to talk about her new program, Rise Up Singing, and related things that you just need to know about. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. It's a real privilege to be here. Thank you. Lisa, one of the things that I'm so eager to find out about is what is the Song a Day Challenge and how do I win? <laughs> well, if you're asking, I think you've won already. <laughs> so, um, so let me back up just a little bit to give people a real sense of uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay. So I am the founder of The Bird Sings. Mm -hmm. The Bird Sings is my business and it's dedicated exclusively to restoring community singing into its rightful place in our daily lives mm -hmm. as a really powerful, transformative, and accessible uh, arts opportunity. And so to that end, there's, I offer workshops, I offer classes, I offer international retreats, but I find that there's two primary barriers to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one we can talk about maybe a little bit later. Okay. It's uh, the vulnerability that gets elicited okay. from people when you say, let's sing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the second one is a lack of a real cohesive large body of repertoire of songs um, that we all know. You get mm -hmm. 20 people in a room together and you say, okay, come up with a song you all know and sing it. It will always be happy birthday or row, row, row your boat. <laughs> and so I just think, you know, wow, what does that say? Yeah. You know, we have so many more songs than that, and we need to create more songs. And songs that are learnable in five minutes or less and uh -huh. require no music and require no lyric sheets even. So uh -huh. things that can be passed through oral tradition is my interest. And so the 2014 Song a Day Challenge is in that interest. So every single day in 2014, I'm releasing one song. And is it a song that you wrote or a song that somebody else has written? All of the above. So, oh, wow. So lots and lots and lots of songs that you already know and don't remember that you know. Wow. You know, this little light of mine. Oh. You know, we have so many great songs, Amazing Grace, and yeah. songs that lots of us know but forget that we know. Mm -hmm. So it's cataloging and, and incorporating those. It's also finding a lot of international songs, songs that are extremely popular in Java, Indonesia, ah. right? But we don't know in America, sure, sure. or Irish pub songs, I or uh, <laughs> African freedom <laughs> songs, you know, songs that are uh, so generating from international traditions. Uh -huh. um, and then we need to contribute new repertoire because as we evolve as a culture, we need new music to resonate with our modern heart. So I contribute songs and I also bring on a lot of songwriting guests who contribute wow. songs. So what happens? So what's the challenge part? The challenge is to make it a daily practice for oh. yourself. To sing for 10 minutes every single day in 2014 and see how it changes your life. I think that's so wonderful. I know I love to sing, but I know too that it can be really intimidating to mm -hmm. sing, especially in a group and um, you know, even now, even though I love to sing and I've, I've done a, even a little bit of performing, it still can be intimidating. So if somebody wanted to, I guess if you're just singing at home for the challenge, you, you can do that and, and that's not a problem. But um, what about to come to your workshops and you talked about retreats and, and different things. How much experience does somebody need to have to, to really, prior experience before they have a great experience with you? Exactly. Uh, one requirement. What's that? 
human. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> that's pretty easy. <laughs> Although there have been dogs in my workshops <laughs> before too. Uh, no, I believe singing is fundamental to the human experience, mm -hmm. that we were born to sing and all of us sang as children. Nobody needs right. to be taught how to sing. They need mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. uh, have their hand held as they release the barriers that have been created in their life between them and their natural self-expression. So singing is vulnerable because it, you can't lie when you yeah. sing, right? It elicits a very authentic energy from our bodies. And to just give that away or to yeah. show that is like, oh, God, yeah. you know, can elicit, uh, you know, to every kind of degree levels of, you know, from mild anxiety to absolute panic, you know, that I've seen <laughs> in terror in people. And so I think it's so fascinating that, you know, some people would run naked through the streets before they would sing the national anthem in yeah. front of somebody. Yeah. And so um, I think it's really important to offer these really safe haven uh, spaces where people can come. I had a student who came for three whole classes and sat through three whole classes without singing a single note. Did she feel pressure to, to get started or any nervousness or, or she was okay when she was ready she could start well she she's the only one who could speak to her own process but um, my interest is in making it absolutely as safe and as accessible as possible which is why she came back the fourth week and started yes. <laughs> and a few years later she was singing solos oh. you know so there we get good at what we practice and when we practice courage we get good at courage that's and wonderful. that's a really powerful thing that I see all the time and feel very privileged to witness in the singers that find me. So you, the workshops go each week? Every single week so I teach classes, I teach workshops, I teach retreats and so there's something always going on. I teach two classes a week, sometimes more. One in Big Sur every Wednesday evening and one in Monterey every Monday evening. And about how many students do you usually have? That's the first question I usually get <laughs> and I don't have a really good answer because it it's varies. always very, uh -huh. and it's usually growing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Big Sur we had a class that met for five years with, wow. you know, six to eight of us. And it was really lovely, and I f I'm very close now with that group uh -huh. of, of people. But that has now grown and almost doubled in size in Big Sur, and then the Monterey class is um, actually getting substantially larger than that. So it really is just building on itself. You know, people have a good experience, and then they tell their friends. So. Wonderful. Um, so tell me some of the things that people get from um, their whole experience. What are the kinds of stories that they tell you after they've been around yeah. for, you know, you said five years, yeah. you know, a couple of years. What do they say? So singing scientifically now, they're proving common sense, right? That singing builds uh, empathy. It <laughs> builds, uh, it fires mirror neurons in our brain. It actually synchronizes our heart rate variability within 10 seconds of singing together. So, amazing. so it's just really profound. So for me, the most really valuable thing that I get reflected to me and also I obviously feel in my own life is a sense of connectedness, a sense of I'm not al alone yeah. and I get to have this shared experience and that carries through with me when I leave the room, right? Because I can sing a song and I'm instantly transported back to my group. One of the exercises I do in my workshops is I have everybody take their hand and place it on the back of the person to their <laughs> left. And then I ask them to hold it there for a minute and then remove their hand and ask if everybody can still feel the hand on their back, which is a universal yes. Wow. And so singing is the same way. Songs stay yeah. with us. They stay in our bodies in a different way than just words do. And the sense of community stays. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks You're for welcome. your leadership and thanks for your wonderful workshops. Thanks, thanks a lot. I am so excited today to have with me in the studio the new executive director for the Monterey Museum of Art, Charlotte Ironman. Charlotte, welcome to the Arts of the Answer. Thanks so much, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I met you. You are a bundle of dynamic and creative energy, and, and it's just so great to see you come in here and things start moving around. You, you, you've, you've got some new initiatives, but you also have some really cool exhibits that are going to be happening 
now and yeah. in March and well, April. Well, we, we always have great things going on at the museum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm building on a, a very strong foundation. And the museum is wonderful. It has been for a long time. We're celebrating our 55th anniversary this year. And it's an exciting opportunity as a new director to come in and build on the successes of the past and build on that momentum and, and move forward in some new directions as well. So we celebrate the art of California, past, present, and future. And we're a collecting museum, so we have fabulous collections and exhibitions. Now, the David, tell us a little bit about the David Laguerre and then what's going on over, over at the Absolutely. Uh, we have actually four exhibitions on view right now. Um, the Monterey Museum of Art is one museum, but we have two locations. So we have our Pacific Street location, which is featuring exhibitions by David Laguerre, who is a painter, mm -hmm. and Bob Kolbrenner, who is a photographer. Both of them live in Monterey County. Uh, both of them are longtime residents, and their work is inspired by this landscape. Um, David Laguerre opened in November and then is continuing until April the 28th, and that's part of our Monterey Now series, and oh. his show is called David Laguerre, River Mountain Sea, and there are three monumental paintings and some studies. And he's a fascinating painter, he's a wonderful man, really interesting mind, lovely person, mm -hmm. and he has a kind of tremendous facility with a very representational art, right. but it, it looks almost um, illusionistic, mm -hmm. but there's a great deal of, of thinking and intervention, and there's a kind of theoretical quality, as well as being just astonishingly beautiful landscapes. Mm -hmm. So he's a wonderful painter. Mm -hmm. And then the Bob Kolbrenner exhibition, also on view at Pacific Street, um, runs also until April 28th. How about hours? I, I, there were some hours changes? Yeah, we changed the hours um, with the new year. It, it, it was an initiative that had been discussed for a long time and mm -hmm. had been kind of stated in a you know strategic document at one point. And I'm, I'm big into the strategic documents okay. and uh, working within a structure, but also taking advantage of opportunities. So we had these amazing exhibitions opening in mid-January and took advantage of the kind of need to be um, more, have hours that are more convenient for people. Okay. So we are now open at both locations, Thursdays through Mondays, 11 to 5. Okay. And we previously had been closed on Mondays. But this is a, it's a destination for tourists and people right. who live here, who have friends that come and visit, mm -hmm. and people who live here who might find it convenient all those long weekends. So mm -hmm. we're now open for a, a full museum day on Sundays, which was not the case before, and, and on Mondays. And we're open in the evenings at La Mirada until 8 p.m. And have also introduced a lot of programming to support that evening activity. And the turnout has been tremendous. We're, we couldn't be happier with the response we've been getting. 55 years, is there anything? Anything big coming toward us in the summer? Well, or every fall, every day or? is a big day at the museum, Steve. Absolutely. But we have um, opening in May at the La Mirada location. We have a contemporary painting show, which is f our works from our collection, which is complemented by very generous loans from the distinguished collection of Chomp, the Community ah. Hospital of Monterey Peninsula. Sure. And so we have about 15 works from Chomp, 40 of our own, and that's a contemporary painting show. Mm -hmm. It coincides with the, an event at the museum called Art in Bloom, which is five days of floral displays in the galleries, but the exhibition continues um, after that into September. And then we have um, opening at the same time, um, we'll have uh, great works from our permanent collection on view at La Mirada as well, the, our iconic early California landscape paintings. Okay. We have many, many of them, sure. but a uh, very uh, high level selection will be on view at La Mirada as well. Okay. And we'll also be having family days and the Art and Bloom events. Um, we have at Pacific Street a major exhibition of a 19th century French artist mm -hmm. named Jules Tavernier, mm -hmm. and that's an exhibition that was organized by the Crocker Art Museum. Wow and it's opening there, it's on there now, okay. uh, when your viewers see this, uh -huh. and it's coming to us opening in early June, and we're looking forward to an array of exciting events because he was a French artist who came to San Francisco, then mm -hmm. to Monterey. Mm -hmm. We have this history as an artist colony and mm -hmm. a magnet for artists, so yes. he was one of the kind of pioneers of that, and he also went to Hawaii, and he was a fascinating guy, so we'll be having, you know, things about Monterey, Hawaii, and, and France um, during the run of this show, and we'll have another Monterey Now exhibition Malin Lager is opening also in June. So much excitement. So much excitement, Steve. Every day, every week, and for months and months and years to come. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, Thank embracing you. us. At Thank you. Thank you. the answer. Well, it's an honor to be on your program. It's an honor to be here in our community, and I'm thrilled to be at the museum where we work with such a great team. Hi. My name is Walter Rice. I'm the arts writer at the Monterey County Weekly, 
And I'm glad to have on the show as a guest, Luis Camada. Mm -hmm. He's a, a filmmaker and also a film professor at CSUMB. Luis, thanks for being on the show. It's my pleasure, Walter. Thank you for having me. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> um, let me start off by asking you, uh, where were you born and raised? I was born in Mexico City, mm -hmm. and that's where I spent the first uh, 13 years of my life. And then we moved to a city called Querétaro in Mexico, and I spent my teenage years there. So I was born and raised in Mexico. Okay. And, um, and it was there, I believe, as a filmmaker that um, the medium first sort of inspired you. Yeah, my mother was a dentist and she had a, uh, uh, an office right next to a movie theater and I'd often go there in the afternoons to do my homework and when I was done I could go to the movies and I would often sneak into the more grown up films that I wasn't allowed to watch and they really haunted me and stayed with me and that's kind of what got me started on the path of wanting to make films. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the films that you snuck into? Raging Bull, The Elephant Man. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> definitely more adult fare. Definitely, and there was a Paul Newman film called The Verdict uh, that was really the catalyst for me because there was a scene where he cracks an egg into a glass of beer and drinks it and then walks over to a pinball machine. And I was watching that scene and I was like, somebody told him to do that and, and move the camera and had him move that way. And I was like, huh, you know, it was such a small moment, but I could f sense the, the intelligence behind it. And I thought, I want to be that person. Well, you have a, uh, a film that you did make, a feature film. That's um, right. That you wanted to make, <coughs> you and Gabrielle, mm -hmm. Silencio. That's right. Talk about Silencio a bit. Well, um, again, it's, uh, it's something that, it's a very personal film that came about through uh, having a friend in Mexico in the city of Querétaro where I grew up. And, and he's a producer and, and, and he makes films uh, too. And he'd never made a feature and he wanted to make a film in Querétaro. And I always wanted to go back there. I haven't lived there in 20 years. I always wanted to go back to and make a film because it's a very rich, uh, visually rich environment. and. Uh, and I have a lot of connection to it, just personally. And he said, oh, I, I have this camera. Uh, I have some money. Mm -hmm. Why don't you come to Mexico next summer and we'll make a film? And uh, I had this idea, again, just from dreams and, and just subconscious. I didn't know where it was going, but I had this idea, these images of this boy wandering around a hotel by himself mm -hmm. and his mother neglecting him. And, uh, and starting from that basis, we started to write the story. And uh, what we came up with was the story of a young boy with, uh, who has an American mother, mm -hmm. who's played by Gabrielle. And the boy's played by her son, <coughs> Dexter, um, whose mother is addicted to pills and incapable of taking care of him. And his father was kind of like a Don Juan figure who seduced the mother and left her and then died. And she is in Mexico with the kid trying to see, because she said, she's not an un uncaring mother, but she's an incompetent mother. Uh -huh. And she wants somebody to take the kid off her hands while she gets better. And uh, she's trying to convince the family of the boy to take uh, the kid off her hands. And, and you know, this is a very kind of like a traditional melodramatic setup. Mm -hmm. But where the story goes really is into trying to explain, uh, to explore the, the world of the boy mm -hmm. through his imagination and how he interprets the events that are happening and how he creates stories that he tells himself to try to make sense of the behavior of the grown-ups around him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the impulse then was to try to explore how we use stories in our life and narratives and personal mythologies to uh, to deal with our personal traumas. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we latched on to. You've also done, um, or spoken at, a couple of festivals, correct? Yeah, I, I was invited to, to um, you know how Alfred Hitchcock made the film uh, Vertigo in San Juan Bautista, and they had an outdoor screening of it at the, at the mission there, and they invited me to, to give a presentation about Alfred Hitchcock's art and techniques. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I was invited to speak at the Golden State Theater by the 
Henry Miller Library yeah. and introduced the film Psycho and North by Northwest. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, as I was joking earlier, I don't know how I became the big Hitchcock expert, <laughs> other than actually just by being a fan of his work. It's been bestowed yeah. upon you. Somehow, yeah. Um. Maybe because there's nobody else. <laughs> Um, so what about uh, also another thing that we like to explore here is mm -hmm. the, the place in which the film uh, or the artist, and in your case filmmaker, mm -hmm. um, lives. How does Monterey County figure into your, <coughs> your work? Well, that's, that's a great question because uh, I, I, after being here for four years, uh, my, my first impulse when I, when I, when I, for the first film I made while I was here was to go to Mexico to make it because of this opportunity that came up. But in reality, right before my friend called me and said, let's come to Mexico and make a film, my impulse was to make a film here. Because once Gabriela and I moved here and we established our life here and you, know, you start to become aware of the richness, the visual richness of your surroundings but also the, the different social issues that are occurring. And, and, and you start to find things that you say, I want to I show the world what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, interestingly enough, we shot some scenes from the film in Mexico. We shot them here, these, some flashback scenes. And, and that was my first foray into making films here. But now, I'm, uh, Gabriela and I are more interested in making, uh, well, there's three kinds of films. One, I, I think that something about this area to me speaks a lot about, uh, about man's relationship to nature and the environment and conserving. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because we, you know, we have the bay, uh, we have all these water resources, you know, there's a drought going on. Um, so I want to make dramas that explore that aspect of, uh, in a dramatic way, you know, but also I just shot a little documentary about the about the drought. Uh, I went to the Los Padres Dam and shot the environment there to try to make an experimental documentary. Okay. And at the same time, you know, seeing, you know, coming from Mexico and looking at the Hispanic community and, and, and their struggles and what they go through here, I want to make films about that, but here. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like we have a, a lot to look forward to from you. Well, I hope so. Hello, my name is Bernice House with the Arts Council. In our next segment, dancers of the Indian community of Monterey County perform during their Diwai Festival or Festival of the Lights. This cultural organization was founded in 2007. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for watching our program. As you can see, we live in a region that is so rich and diverse with artistic talent. The arts are magical, but they don't happen by magic alone. So join us, behind the camera or right in front of it. Get more involved today. We think that you too will discover the, the arts, arts are, are the, the answer. answer.